remember that first Sunday 40 years ago. Yeah, yeah. I do too. Yeah, hey, hey. I was there. Good. How yeah. many were alive 40 years ago? <laughs> How many were alive 40 years ago? It's the, a minority. The girls in the kids zone, there was a couple of girls in there. They were, they were trying to figure out what year I was born. I'm like, whatever. Like, go, yeah. Keep going, keep going. Before we had electricity. <laughs> Before we had cars. That is so sad. Okay, hey, whatever. Hey. No, that's not true. Hey, but it's exciting. Uh -huh. Really, we're more excited about the next 40 uh -huh. that's and right. what God's doing and where we're going. Yeah. Eh? Well, I, I really do honestly really believe the, that the longer you walk with God, that his love becomes more and more real in your life. You know, when you, it's kind of like in marriage. You know, when you first get married, you're like, oh, my gosh, I love him the most I could ever love him. But as you go through life and you go through all the you know, parts of life, you realize, man, it just keeps blossoming. And I feel like that with church and with the family of God, that it's just, and with God, it's like, oh, no, it just keeps getting better and better. And, and as we were thinking about New Year's Eve to us also is a time of, you know, there is, it's a time of just kind of making sure your heart is set right as you walk into what earth creates as a new year. Because, you know, I mean, God could create any you know, he, he looks at that calendar and says, whatever. But we do on earth, we have a new year, and you can set it right and really receive a miracle of leaving one year into the next year. And I told um, Case in the, in the right, right this morning, um, I had one of our great uh, members, Mike, come and talk to me, and he said uh, he fell at his job um, a few months ago, literally fell and hit his head, ended up in Harborview, and and had a concussion, a very serious concussion, and he ended up with having um, extremely um, uh, head pain, like headaches and continuous head pains after this fall that he had had. Months had gone by, and the, no healing was in sight. And anybody that's dealt with that kind of pain, it just affects everything in your life and in your world. And about three months ago, he was in the service, and there was a time and a moment that um, just the Spirit of the Lord said, pray very specifically for people with head pains. And, and I specifically um, put my hand like exactly where he had fallen, and he looked at his wife and he said, I, I'm, a, I'm receiving a miracle. And he, and, he, and he said, from that moment on, he has never had head pain again. Wow. The Lord still does miracles. Amen. And, the, and that's what we, that church family, if we could encourage each other with our God is a God of miracles. And you know, sometimes, you know, you look at your own life in your world and you're like, no, no, you don't understand. I've done this or I've had this pain or I've done this in my life or I've had this failure in relationships or financially I've done this and it's never going to be okay. You know, our God is a God of new chance and redemption and new things can happen in people's lives and worlds. It's not about... Like, if, if we can stop the power of God by not believing. But it, it says that Jesus could do no mighty works where there was unbelief. But we are a people that believe. We are Christian faith, and we have faith to believe for your life. All of us together. It's not just one of us. It's all of us that we say, let's believe for miracles that bring, that, that, that one thing happened, but God is the miracle power that brings just a healing in different realms of our life. And I kind of, I really, really would love to encourage you to say, you know, New Year's Eve, I'm going to come, and I'm going to come with my little list of failures. You might even list them and walk in the door with those little list of failures. You, can, you don't have to declare them. You don't have to tell us, but you can have them there, and you can say, Father, I'm just going to go ahead and leave those here in this year, and I'm going to walk into the new year and receive what God has for you in 2020. Can we do that? Amen. Let's do that. Amen. All right, let's pray for that. Thank you, Father, mm -hmm. for your word. Thank mm -hmm. you for your spirit. Yeah. Thank you for the plan that you have for us, yes. in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, Wendy's going to get my uh, Bible for me there up the front row. And we're going to dive into the Word today. So good to have you in church. And I've been praying all week that God is helping us exit and helping us enter. And this Sunday is always a little bit strange in the calendar because it's not Christmas, it's, it's not, uh, you know, part of the holiday season, but it's not quite New Year. And uh, so we're in the, uh, the exit and the entrance. We're going through the doorway into 
what God has for us next. And Wendy mentioned it, God planned in our humanity to have regular opportunities to start over, right? Seven days. We start a new week on Sunday. We get to start over every seven days. Every month, we start over. You on your job probably have goals for the week, for the month, for the year. And you have these, these marks, these established points where you can complete and start again. And so it's a normal process and a necessary process in life where you say, okay, I'm done with that and I'm moving to a new place. When, when we're children, it's very obvious. You change classrooms, you change teachers, you go from first grade to second grade and on through school. So the new year becomes very clear and uh, you have those very specific things. But as adults, it can all become a blur. And so I believe most adult people do not have a new year. Oh, they may go out and party, or they, they may celebrate, and they may, you know, do something on New Year's Eve, but they don't really have a new year, they just have another year. We didn't plan for anything new. We didn't expect anything new. We didn't believe for anything new. We just went on into the new year and had another year. Of course, you've heard the studies. They talk about it on the radio, in the news, and uh, you can find it as you uh, look into human behavioral studies. Most of our New Year resolutions have ended by the end of the first month. Very few resolutions make it to a second month, and even less to a third, and even less to a change in our life. However, you were created to have vision, to have dreams, to have goals, to have things that you reach for and believe for. God designed you that way. That's the way he is, and you're made in his likeness and image. God had a dream of humanity made in his image in a relationship with him. And uh, he knew that mankind, given the choice, would make mistakes, they would fall. So he designed a plan, a redemption, a new birth that would supersede the first birth. Our first birth, we were born in sin. Our second birth, we are born in new life and the righteousness of God. And from the moment that man sinned in the Garden of Eden, God spoke that plan into being. He said to the serpent, the woman will give birth to a child. He got very specific as the Old Testament went on. He began to speak that new birth. He said he'll be born in Bethlehem. He'll be born in this family, in this tribe. And from that time, he'll then go to Egypt. And then he'll come back into Nazareth. And from Nazareth, he will. And God spoke very clearly his plan, his vision, his dream for a family who would believe in him. And so you and I are here in church thousands of years later because God had a vision and he wanted sons and daughters. So we are not just servants of God. We're not just here because we're Methodist, Lutheran, Catholic, Presbyterian, or whatever. We're here because we are Christians. We are sons and daughters of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And you are made like him. Therefore, you Live best, live your best life when you have visions, dreams, goals, things you reach for. Now, I know many of you say, I'm not good at that. You, you don't make that plan. You haven't planned for the new year. You're not expecting increase in the new year. You're not expecting much change in the new year. You just kind of go along and you survive and and you do okay. But God says you are made in his likeness and image. And I want to challenge you today to change what you believe about yourself. Hopefully by the end of my message, you'll change some of what you believe about God. But let's start 
with what you believe about yourself. I would argue that every one of you are great at making a vision, having a plan, having a purpose. You are good at it, and you practice it regularly. The problem is you don't really practice it for your life. You practice it for shopping at the grocery store. Right? You get a list. You say, I need corn, I need beans, I need milk, I need bread. And you go with a vision and you text yourself or you write it down and you fulfill that vision. You say, as you leave the grocery, yep, 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 got it done. Some of you do that on a daily basis. You have your to do list, that's your vision. That's what you're focused on. That's where you're going. And some of you get great reward when you check things off that list. I have a couple that I work with, a couple people that I work with, and I know they're all about their to-do list. Sometimes I'll get a call to go into a meeting, and I'll be like, "Uh uh-oh, they got a to-do list, and they need to check things off. That's a vision. That's a plan. That's your purpose. That's your goal. Some of you do that for your vacation every year. When you come to church, you say, I'm not very good at that vision thing. I'm not very good at that planning and believing for the future. I'm not, I I just don't roll that way. You're wrong. I want you to change what you believe about yourself. When it comes to your vacation, you are a visionary. You are a planner. You get on a mission and you fulfill that mission. You start talking about, we're going to Disneyland, and we're gonna go on Alaska Airlines, and we're gonna stay at the Disneyland Hotel, and we're gonna get a Uber from the airport, and we're gonna rent a car. Boy, you got that vision laid out. And when we get into Disneyland, the first thing we're gonna do is buy us some Mickey ears. And we're all going to wear the Disneyland sweatshirt. And then we're going to go see the princess says, we're going to get some princess pictures. You have a vision. You have a plan. You have a mission. And you fulfill it. And don't let any child get in the way of your plan. (laughs) Right? It always happens, doesn't it? Two hours into the Disneyland trip, the three-year-old is finished. I want to go home. You're like, hey, you're going to have fun. And you're going to go hug that princess right there. You're on mission. You have a vision. You planned this. And you want it to succeed. What if you did that for January, and February, and March, and April, and the rest of 2020? What if you did that for your health, and your eating, and your prayer, and your Bible study? Your marriage, and you and your husband got in agreement. 2020, our marriage is going to a new place. We're going to write down a couple of things. We're going to get better at it. We're going to write down a couple of things that will make our marriage more of what we want. Maybe there's a couple of things I'm going to stop doing, but it's really more important about what I start doing. So that's what God does. That's how God rolls. He's got this thing planned out even Till the end of the age. We may not understand it all. We certainly don't know all the specifics, but we know he's coming again. We know that he's coming for a glorious church. We know that he is going to catch us away, and we're going to live with him for eternity. Some of us that have already gone on through death have simply graduated early. Some will be alive when the Lord returns. Man, I wish I knew the day, but I don't. I just need to be ready because he's coming soon. Now, we've been saying that for many generations, but that's the attitude that we live with because our Father told us the plan. What's the plan for your year? You're made like him. What's the plan for your future, your career, your finances, your health, your marriage, your children. We don't control everything. And many times it doesn't work out exactly as we'd hoped. But where there is no vision, people perish. Where there's no vision, people live sad lives. Where there is no vision, people smoke way too much pot and drink way too much beer. 
Because where there is no vision, you spend a lot of time medicating the pain of your reality. When you have a vision, you're moving past your pain. When you have no vision, you're living in your pain. So are you moving on or surviving in? Many of us pride ourselves, I'm a survivor. I'm just hanging in there. I'm just living life. I take things day by day. That's not how you were created. You'll never have your best life thinking that way. Start with a plan. Here's how I eat. Here's how I pray. Here's how I believe. Here's where I am with my career. Here's where I want to be with my career. And you start thinking that way and dreaming in 2020. Whoo! You'll be surprised at what the Lord can do. Yeah. Wendy said it. Jesus met some people where he could know could do no mighty works, they wouldn't let him, they wouldn't believe. But then he met other people where he did amazing works. Which one are you? Are you the one that says, all right, Lord, I'm ready. Do it, bring it, let's go. Or are you one of those ones with your head down saying, well, I don't think it's going to happen and I'm just going to try to get by and my husband won't let me and my wife probably won't agree, and we can all find reasons to stop, or we can all look up to the Lord and start to go. I want to share a story with you this morning from the Old Testament. It's about a king named Jehoshaphat. That's a great name, isn't it? Let's start a movement, start naming our kids Jehoshaphat. You can call him Josh, you can call him Haas, you can call him Fat. You would have three kids, Jehoshaphat. And I mean fat in a good way. That is fat. So Jehoshaphat was a king during the time when Israel was separated in two kingdoms. One was called Judah, the tribe of praise, and Jerusalem. The other was called Israel, and that was made up of ten tribes. So Jehoshaphat was a king for 25 years. He was a very godly king. He sought the Lord. He was faithful to God. In fact, Jehoshaphat started church campuses in the sense that Jehoshaphat sent the priests around the nation to teach the Bible on a regular basis. He was one of the first kings to do that. In other words, make the Bible a part of the people's consciousness and how they lived. So Jehoshaphat was a great king. But at one point in his life and his reign, several nations, which are really tribes, people groups, gathered together to take him out. It's no different from today. That piece of property that God said is the promised land, the land of Israel, has been fought over for many thousands of years, still being fought over today. Last week, they're firing rockets at it, and, and the, Israel has its defense forces operating, and it's never changed because where God puts his name, the enemy just can't stand it. So that enemy continues to attack Israel even today. So five groups, five nations are coming against Jehoshaphat and the nation of Judah. And I want you to see what he did. Because if you and I can follow his example, if we can face our enemies the way Jehoshaphat did, we can win the way he did. Now, what's our enemies? Well, for some, it's fear. That enemy of fear holds us back. For some of us, it's doubt, just that small thinking, negative thinking. For some of us, it's depression. We just carry that heaviness. We live in a state of mental disease. Our mental health isn't quite there. For some of us, it's anger. And we get mad, and we stomp around, and we treat the people closest to us in the worst way. Some people, it might be poverty. Poverty is a curse. It's not a blessing. It's God's will that you prosper. Jesus came that you have life and have life more abundantly. But many people aren't sure. They're not convinced that God wants them to prosper. 
Maybe today you could make that shift. The Apostle John said, I pray that you prosper above all things. Now, he wouldn't have prayed it if it wasn't God's will. And the Holy Spirit wouldn't have put it in Scripture if it wasn't God's will. It's God's will that you prosper above all things. Prosperity isn't a number. It's not an amount of money. It's a lifestyle where you are blessed and you can be a blessing, where you have more than what you need to fulfill your mission, and you can help others fulfill their mission. You don't live to get. You live to give because you are a prosperous person. You're not always thinking, how do I get a blessing? You're more thinking, how can I be a blessing? Because you are a prosperous person. So this is God's will and God's plan. And you've got to face every enemy that will keep you from that, that will steal that and hold you back from the life God's called you to. Remember, it's not just about you. If you are living that abundant life, if you're living that blessed life, how many people will be saved because of you? How many people will be helped because of you? Think of a child who gets saved at birth or early childhood disease. They grow up, they get married, they have children, the children grow up and have children, grandchildren, great-grand. That one life affected how many? Just in the natural. But then think of all the relationships, friendships, connections. Hundreds of people affected by one life. That's why we always fight for every baby. We always fight for every human. We never pray or, or, or want someone to lose their life because that life affects so many other lives. So if you are blessed, prospering, living an abundant life, how many will come to Jesus because of you? How many will get saved because of you? How many could be healed because of you? How many lives will be affected by your life being where God wants it to be? Well, I don't think you can count the numbers. I often think about Julius, who was my spiritual father, 40 years ago when we started our church, it was because Julius got out of prison. He'd been convicted as a habitual felon. They called him a habitual criminal. And they said, you'll never get out of prison. But he changed. He came to God. God started doing a miracle in his life. The next thing he knows... He's standing on the streets of Seattle with a new opportunity, a born-again man. Well, because of Julius, he started a rehab center. I went in and got saved. Well, you're all sitting here today because of this church, and it all started with one habitual criminal, one man. You're here because a habitual criminal loved you and told me to love everybody. Hey, the next time you get an attitude and you're unforgiving and you're hateful and you're thinking, how can he ever come back and who does, I'll never forgive that person. Just remember, you're sitting in church because a habitual criminal gave his life to God. Yeah, and they call Jesus a lot of things too. So maybe we should just love people and be gracious and let the Lord do his work. Amen. So let's read about Jehoshaphat. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Jehoshaphat. I just love that name, don't you? Chapter 20, verse 2. Some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, a great multitude is coming against you. From beyond the sea, from Syria, verse 3, Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord, and from all Judah they came to seek the Lord. Verse 15, 
He said, listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat, this is a prophet, began to speak to them. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you'll find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. And you will not need to fight this battle. Position yourselves. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Verse 20, they rose early in the morning, went out to the wilderness, and as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe his prophets, and you will prosper. Come on, somebody. If you believe the word of the Lord, you will prosper. When he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord. Praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army. What? We're going to send the choir ahead of the army? And they said, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Verse 22, when they began to sing and praise, the Lord sent ambushments against the enemy and they were defeated. Verse 23, the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they'd made an end of the inhabitants of Mount Seir, they helped to destroy one another. They started praising God. The enemy got so confused, he forgot who he was fighting. Come on, your fear will leave you. Your anxiety will leave you. Your attitude will leave you. That pro poverty will leave you. If you'll begin to walk with God. Well, then Jehoshaphat, verse 25, and the people came to take away their spoil. They found among them an abundance of valuables on their dead bodies and precious jewelry, which they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away. And there they were, three days, gathering the spoil because there was so much. Verse 27, they returned, every man to Judah and Jerusalem, with Jehoshaphat in front of them, to go back to Jerusalem with joy, for the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. Number one, we prosper when we believe God's word. Have you ever made a decision that the Bible is the authority in your life? that the Bible is the highest word in your life? What God said is more important than what you feel, than what is your tradition, your family's tradition, your, your national culture. Anything is second to this word of the Lord. Have you ever decided what God said is more real than what the doctor said, more real than what the banker said? more real than what the neighbor said, what grandma said, what anybody said. Have you ever made a decision to live this Bible? Now you'll not do it perfectly. No one can do it perfectly. The Bible said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But we give it our best and we say this is the authority. I'll never forget one of my friends who's here today. I think maybe the first time he's in our church, I said, let's make the Bible the authority. Let's make the word the most important thing in our life. And if we ever have an earthquake, let's just stand on the word. The Bible said heaven and earth will pass away, but not one letter of God's word will ever pass away. When everything starts shaking, I'm going to stand on the word. Right? When everything is falling apart, let's stand on the word. When everything looks bad, let's stand on the word. 
when it seems like all the enemies of hell have come against us, we're going to stand on the word. Boy, I'll tell you, in 40 years, there have been more than one time when Wendy and I had nothing but a word of promise. We weren't sure who was our friends. We weren't sure who would be here on Sunday. We weren't sure what would happen in our future, but we stood on the word of the Lord. And so, have you ever decided to make the Bible real in your life? If you ever do, you're on your way because Jehoshaphat said, believe his prophets and you will prosper. Remember Jesus said, the law and the prophets will never fail. Do you believe them? Well, I know you have a Bible on your coffee table. I know you grew up went to church. Oh, yeah, I believe the Bible. But really? Do you really? Is it your playbook? Is it your life book? Number two, we prosper when we seek the Lord with prayer and fasting. Let's start on New Year's Eve. We'll just pray and we'll praise and we'll enter into that new year with the prayer of God on our heart. Fasting is that discipline to set aside the things of the world. Come on, maybe you could do a little fasting in the next month. We're going to gather our leadership team in the first quarter and just spend some time praying and fasting. You know, maybe you could give up something huge in your life, like coffee or something. Okay, forget about that. Ain't going to do that. Like, now you've gone too far now, Pastor. That's a little too much to ask. But Jehoshaphat called the people. He said, we're going to fast and we're going to pray. God began to work in their life. Number three, we prosper when we praise him, even in the bad situations. Come on, let's practice lifting our hands when we come into church. Let's not watch the praise team praise. Let's shout them down. Let's worship God with all that is within us. Jehoshaphat sent that praise team out ahead of the army. He said, you guys sing, and that's what started the victory enemy got so confused. You know, if you'd sing and worship God, even in your own home, in your own car, that enemy would start to flee. He didn't want to hang around that praise. He'll hang around your whining, gossiping, grumbling, complaining. He gets all up in your business. You start praising God, he's out. He leaves. He will flee the presence of the Lord. And the Bible said God inhabits the praise of of his people. Well, you say, I'm not very good at that. You're going to be good at it at 5 o'clock this afternoon if Marshawn Lynch hits that football field. Come on, somebody. If Marshawn runs over about three or four of the enemy. Oh, yeah, they're the enemy. I see a few red jerseys around here, but today, all right, I mean, I love you on Monday. But today, you the enemy. Why? How are you going to praise when Marshawn runs over about three or four red jerseys? You're going to be like, yeah! You, you spill your beer. Don't tell me you can't praise. Come on, some of you military guys, you know, you're a little stoic. You act a little stiff because you, you want to be strong. You're a soldier. I get it. But you, you also know how to salute and give honor to your officers. And you know if you don't, it's not good. When was the last time you saluted your Father in heaven? When was the last time you gave honor to your God? When was the last time you worshiped Him and gave a salute to God with both hands in the air? Come on, don't tell me you can't praise the Lord. When you start praising God, your enemy gets confused. Your enemy gets pushed back. We prosper when we dream with what God has for us. We prosper when we see what God has in our future. Number five, we prosper when we face our enemies. God said, you don't have to fight, but you got to go out there. You don't got to fight, but you got to go out there. So they had to walk out there in front of their enemies. You know, it would have been nice if they'd just stay home. Like, I'm going to let the Lord do it. I'm going to stay here and watch ESPN. Lord, go get me a job. 
trust in the Lord. You praying for a job watching ESPN. You got to get out there, man. You got to knock on doors. You got to talk to people. Well, I thought I'd let, let the Lord do it. He ain't going to do it if you're sitting at home on the couch. So you got to go. And they went out there in the, in the, in the, in the, in the valley where they fought. And, and they were ready to fight, even though they knew they, they couldn't win. So they just started praising God, and the enemy defeated itself. But if they'd have stayed home, it wouldn't have happened. So you got to get out there. you got to face your enemies. I'm not going to let fear hold me back. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to stay sad sitting at home. Anymore. I'm going to get in church. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to go talk to my boss and ask about that new position. I'm going to go get myself in that school and get that degree finished. I, I'm going to get out there. I'm going to face my enemy, and I'm going to go for this victory because the battle is the Lord's, and the victory is mine. Amen. Come on, stand up with me. Say it with me. The battle is the Lord's, but the victory is mine. I'm going to praise him because the battle is the Lord's, but the victory is mine. Come on, just clap your hands and shout a little bit. <laughs>